recording. Honey, you can stop the music. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Alabama Advance Program, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the Spring Symposium Intersectionality, a Paradigm for Advancing Systemic Change. My name is Paulette Patterson Dilworth, and I serve as the lead investigator and vice president for diversity, equity, and inclusion here at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And again, I'd like to welcome you. And I'm especially honored to welcome our two speakers this morning, um, Dr. Jesse Diaro, who is the NSF project director for program director for the advanced program, and also Dr. Devin Cabrado who is our lead keynote this morning. I'd like to begin by giving you a few housekeeping um, instructions. Um, we will leave some time at the end of our keynote um, for questions if you'd like, and feel free to post your questions in the Q&A. And also I would ask that um, those of you who are backstage, make sure that your microphones are muted and your cameras are off. Um, again, it's a really exciting moment to have you here. I think we have a very exciting morning planned for you. We will begin with our keynote speaker, Dr. Cabrado, and then we have a break coming up at about 10.10, and we will return at 10.25 with a panel discussion that will include all of the co-PIs from our partner institutions, and our closeout keynote will be um, offered by Dr. Diarro. So without um, more conversation from me, I'd like to take this time to introduce our first speaker. We're real honored that Dr. Cabado answered our call um, to join us this morning. He is the Honorable Harry Patterson Professor of Law at the UCLA School of Law and the former Associate Vice Chancellor for Bruin X for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at UCLA. He teaches constitutional criminal procedure and constitutional law, critical race theory, criminal adjudication, and in 2005, Pro Professor Cabado was an inaugural recipient of the Fletcher Foundation Fellowship modeled on the Guggenheim Fellowships. It is awarded to scholars whose work furthers the goals of Brown versus Board of Education. In 2018, he was named an inaugural recipient of the Atlantic Philanthropy, Philanthropies Fellowship for Racial Equity. Professor Cabado graduated from Harvard Law School in 1994 while at Harvard, he was the editor-in-chief of the Harvard Black Letter Law Journal, a member of the Board of Student Advisors and winner of the Northeast Frederick Douglass Moot Court competition. Cabado joined UCLA School of Law faculty in 1997. He served as vice dean for faculty and research at the School of Law from 2006 to 2007, and again in 2009 to 2010. Professor Lobato is currently working on a series of articles on affirmative action and on a book on race, law, and police violence. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Cavado. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Gilbert, for that very generous um, introduction. It really is my pleasure to be here, and I'm looking forward to your uh, collective engagement throughout this session on intersectionality. Uh, so what I thought I might do in the time that I have is to give you a sense of what we might mean by intersectionality by describing the context out of which the concept uh, emerged. But before I get to that context, I want to take us down a detour in a way to Green Valley Farm. And you might say, why this morning, am I taking you to Green Valley Farm to have a conversation about um, intersectionality? Just stay with me and I'll try to explain. Um, so on Green Valley Farm, there are, of course, animals, cows, chickens, and they are also horses. So this is an exercise that in some ways gets us thinking precisely about the question of systemic inequality. What does it look like? Uh, what kind of interventions might we have in mind? So the exercise that I want you to indulge goes something like this. So these are the horses and we're stipulating that the horses are sick. And the question becomes, well, why are the horses sick? And there are a number of responses that you might offer. If we were in person, we'd actually have a conversation about it and we would go back and forth. We can't altogether do that via this uh, webinar, but if you're like other 
audiences, the answer to the question as to why the horses are sick would track in two directions. So one set of responses might focus on the horses themselves. So the horses are sick perhaps because the horses are not eating properly, not drinking properly, not pulling themselves up by their bootstraps maybe. So it's a kind of blame the horses story. It's a story about something the horses are doing to themselves that's bad or something the horses are not doing for themselves that would be good. So again, uh, we're focusing on the horses. Another set of responses might focus on the farmer. So it's not about the horses necessarily, it's about the farmer. The farmer isn't treating the horses in the way that the farmer might. The farmer prefers the chickens to the horses, let's say. We could even call the farmer a horsist, uh, analogous to a racist, let's stipulate. But if we pull back the frame, we begin to see that the horses exist in something of a toxic environment. This is not a clean environment in which to situate the horses. And so quite apart from what the horses are doing to themselves, or quite apart from what the horses are failing to do for themselves, the horses are going to be sick. There's a threat in the air, in other words, that impacts the well-being of the horses that's going to um, shape their realities. Now we could, as an intervention, say to the horses, put on a mask. I don't want to politicize the conversation, but obviously we've gone through a pandemic and we're encouraging people to wear a mask. We could say, look, horses, if you want to avoid that toxicity, put on a mask. That's the way to do it. Alternatively, we could say to the farmer, the best way for us to deal with the realities that confront the horses is for you to have some kind of EDI training about horses, listen to horses train um, uh, experiences. You might do that via, view, uh, via Zoom and have each horse articulate their own narrative. That way you'll have a better sense of their social reality. That's another approach we might offer. The point is not that these approaches are necessarily problematic, but the question is whether or not they get to the core issue. A third approach we might take that is more structural in nature is to clean up the environment, to think about what we might need to do to remove the threat, to create a context in which the horses are living under conditions that does not include that toxicity. And if we engaged in that effort to clean up the environment, we wouldn't say that that's an animal preference for horses, that that wouldn't make any sense. We would simply say, what we're doing at the end of the day is narrow tailoring our approach to put in place a countermeasure that gets at the fact that the horses are living under conditions of toxicity. We need to remove the toxicity. Presumably everyone would think that that's a good thing. Presumably no one would say it's a bad thing to remove the toxicity that confronts the horses to clean up the environment. In many ways, that particular sensibility that we should clean up the environment, that it's not about some problem with the horses necessarily, is an insight that informs intersectionality. So this is a good place for us, it seems to me, to now think about the precise context out of which intersectionality emerge. Now, intersectionality quite clearly builds on lots of discourses uh, around um, exclusion and inclusion, and in particular, discourses that a Black feminist have authored for quite some time, discourses that women of color have offered for quite some time. It builds on that insight, but it does so in a way that addresses particular problems that Black women were confronting in the law, that has extensions to how we might think about 
other kinds of um, problems within particular institutions. So let's start at the very beginning because that's a good place to start with a particular case. So I don't want to get too technical about the particular legal doctrine, but the facts of the case are really helpful to revealing, again, what the intersectional sensibility is and how it might be relevant for our conversation today. So the first case uh, that bears a uh, discussion is the Graffenreid versus General Motors. And the central question that the case presents is, you know, is this a moment of discrimination? Black women were arguing that they were experiencing sex discrimination in the context of this case. And the court had to answer that um, uh, claim and did so by way of the uh, contention that Black women were not experiencing sex discrimination. So they're working at General Motors, they're claiming it's sex discrimination, and the court says, no, it's not. And part of the reason the court says there's no sex discrimination going on is because white women within General Motors were not experiencing sex discrimination. So General Motors had indeed hired white women to occupy the front office. They were in that particular role. So the court is thinking, well, how can we call an institution sexist if it's the case that they're giving jobs to women, albeit white women, but it cannot be sexism if white women are in fact benefiting from the employment opportunities the company affords. So central to the court's thinking in this regard is the idea that black women and white women experience the same sexism. Because if that were not the case, if the court took a different view that black women and white women experience different sexisms, then it would have reached a different conclusion. But the idea is, if you have sexism within an institution, it's going to impact white, white women. If it's not impacting white women, then you don't have sexism. That's the basic idea. The next case that's relevant to our thinking is one in which black women are trying to certify a class for all women. So you've might be familiar with class action litigation. So litigation can arise in two contexts. I can bring a single claim of discrimination saying that I have been harmed in some particular way, but I might want to bring a, a discrimination that's based on a class. It could be a class of all professors. I'm representing all professors at a particular institution and I'm claiming discrimination. So in this particular claim, black women are attempting to bring a class-based lawsuit suggesting that they can represent the interests of all women. So what happens to them, Black women are saying, is an indication that discrimination could be impacting all women. So can Black women now represent a class of all women? The court says no. Black women cannot represent a class of all women why? Because they're too different. So pause and think about what this means. So in the graph and read, the court seems to be saying black women and white women experience the same sexism. So if white women are not discriminated against, it's not sexism. In this case, when black women are saying, all right, so we're the same. So let us represent a class that includes all women. Court says, no, 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 you can't do that because you're different. You're different from white women. So you can't presume to represent a class that includes white women. You're too different. That's the second intersectionality problem. The third intersectionality problem then arises when black women say, okay, fair enough. Let us bring a claim of discrimination on the basis of race and gender. Let us assert a claim of discrimination uh, based on the fact that we are black women. The court says, no, you can't do that. To allow you to assert a claim on the basis of race and sex would be preferential treatment. And preferential treatment is bad. No one else gets to combine their claims. Why should you, black women, be permitted to 
bring two categories together, race and sex, to tell your story. Can't allow you to do that. That's preferential treatment. And the, quote has, the court has a quote here that's quite telling of what it means to do. The court suggests that, look, black women don't experience discrimination as a female. They experience discrimination only as a black female. So in that particular quote, to be black is somehow to diminish your status as a female. But the other thing to keep in mind here is that when the court says black women don't experience discrimination as a female, what's hidden from view is the racial specificity of the female in the court's imagination. What the court is really saying is, you don't experience discrimination as a white female, but only as a black female. Because all women have a race. It's just that the race of black women in this instance is being specified because they're being discriminated against along these two axes, not just along one. So this is just a way of seeing the ease with which black women fall through various gaps. Gaps that in this instance preclude them from saying race and gender structure are reality. A, gaps that preclude them from standing in for sexism writ large. And gaps that mean that if white women are not experiencing disadvantage, courts are saying there is no disadvantage. That's the context out of which intersectionality arose. The footnote to all of this, and it's a big one, is that the same dynamic occurred with respect to race. That is to say, in cases where Black women would say, we're experiencing racism, the court would say, but you can't possibly be experiencing racism because we've hired Black men. A racist firm wouldn't hire black men. So if black men are being hired, it cannot be racism. Whatever it is, it's not racism. And then when black women say, well, look, we want to represent a class that includes black men and black women, no, you can't do that. You're different from black men. So you can't bring a class action suit that includes black men in it. That's not going to work. And when black women say, okay, let me now make a claim that's race and gender, again, one sees the same kind of answer. So the key insight here is to recognize how a structure, in this instance, law, articulates itself in ways that denies the experiences that a group has. In this instance, we're talking about Black women. We could obviously be talking about other social categories, but that's what we're talking about here to demonstrate the link between a structure, the gap it creates, and the impact of that on a particular intersectional identity. So in thinking about what this might mean within particular institutional domains, we go back to the slide with which I began. How do we think about clearing the air, clearing the environment, so that we're not creating institutional gaps for people to learn, so that we're taking intersectionality seriously? And that might mean that when we're paying attention to student diversity or faculty diversity, we have intersectional sensibilities in mind. Because how a student is going to experience experience herself within an educational institution in the context of STEM or outside of it is going to be determined by what that student configuration looks like and what it looks like with respect to compounded or intersectional identities. Did it with respect to faculty diversity? The fact that you might have gender supposedly unmodified so that we have some women says nothing about whether the faculty demographic representation includes an intersectional sensibility. We could also think about faculty engagements and pedagogical practices with respect to students. 
our faculty engage in students from a deficit model. There's something wrong with you in the same way that we were blaming the horses for the fact that they were experiencing difficulty. Or does a faculty member think about, am I employing a growth mindset when I'm engaging students? Am I assuming that all students can achieve excellence? Am I reaching out with opportunities, mentorship, so that when I check my list, I'm distributing my goodies in ways that reflect intersectional sensibilities? Is the curriculum itself being structured on terms that signal inclusion of people across identity differences? These all create opportunities or not for people to grow within particular institutional settings. If we think about programming, what does the overarching programming look like? This particular program is quite clearly sensitive to these dynamics and seeks to name explicitly why intersectionality might be important as a programmatic initiative. So we can focus on building pipelines, crucial, but what precedes that? What is the institutional landscape on which students are situated? And how does that landscape along the one through six dimensions that I've described draw on intersectionality or are they creating precisely the kind of gaps that I discussed in law in institutional life? That's a hard question that we need to think about. And as we think about this question, clearly it's critical that we understand that the problems around intersectionality and inclusion more general, it's not just about conscious intentionality that we consciously think in ways that produce outcomes that are not intersectional along the lines that we might want. It could also, of course, be a problem of implicit bias. I won't go into the phenomenon here, except to say that you all understand that we have biases of which we are unaware that could structure how we teach, that could structure who we mentor, that could structure what we put in place as programming, that could structure who we admit, that could structure who we hire, that could structure who ends up in precisely the position that allows them to take advantage of opportunities that mitigates the underrepresentation problem uh, about which we are all concerned. So what I've tried to suggest is that intersectionality occurred as a theory in a particular set of cases, but those cases just expose the ways in which we might tackle intersectionality as an institutional um, problem. And as we do so, the key insight is that we focus not on fixing problematic students. That's the wrong frame. That we, but we focus on ensuring that our overarching institutional culture is one that attends to the problems of intersectional um, exclusion, is one that addresses uh, the degree to which there might be gaps that get in the way of achieving the intersectional vision that we might all want. So let me uh, stop here and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Cabado. Um, I would like to start uh, the Q&A with the question because as you were talking, um, it occurred to me that um, the term intersectionality was originally coined to describe bias and the violence that was perpetrated against black women but now it's become more widely used. And I'm wondering, for example, by the LGBTQ issues among others, is that a misunderstanding of the use of intersectionality? Uh, no, not at all. I mean, I think that the, the, the general insight of intersectionality is that there's a relationship between how people experience their social lives and different forms of power. So if power might be working in a way 
that means that it's your race and class or your race and class and sexual orientation that is um, uh, uh, resulting in the disadvantage that one is encountering. What's useful about intersectionality is that it issues from a place that suggests that we can learn about what's happening broadly by actually paying attention to what has happened, is happening to Black women. So Black women's experiences can operate as a prism through which to understand some of these larger issues. So it's not um, uh, a misapplication to say that um, other dimensions of who we are can operate as a site for inequality. It's instead um, uh, a part of the intersectional understanding that suggests that we don't just try and add up identities and make some um, take some view that this or that identity is always at the top or at the bottom. We look at what's happening within particular institutions and we ask ourselves, where are the gaps and who's falling through them? And that might change as you move from one institution um, to another institution. And the final thing I'll say, and then I'll stop, is that sometimes we think that intersectionality is just about marking those who are disadvantaged, but it's also about marking um, different forms of advantage. So in the example that I presented, where the court says Black women don't experience discrimination as a female, it's important to note that the court is actually making a point about race and gender, but it's just not naming the race because it's really saying Black women don't experience discrimination as white women, mm. but, but it doesn't mention the race because in that instance, it doesn't feel like it has to. So exposing the fact that all of us have uh, race and genders and not just Black women um, is also an insight of intersectionality. Sure, thank you for that uh, response. Um, which leads me to another um, question that's kind of, um, it's really complicated by um, the work that we are focusing on with our advanced grant, which is um, intersectionality um, and gender and advancing women in STEM in particular. Um, and while we've made quite a bit of progress um, on some level nationally, most of our institutions continue to struggle with um, um, recruiting and sustaining students. So ultimately there is what one would characterize as a pipeline issue associated with advancing women in STEM. Um, do you think that there's been sort of an erasure or ignoring of the significance of intersectionality as it relates to recruiting and retaining not just our students, but our faculty and others who play important roles in um, increasing and being intentional about increasing representation of women in particular fields. Uh, so I, I think the short answer is yes. I could just say yes and then stop. Uh, yes. I, I, I think that's right. I, the, the only other thing I would add, I, I think is to say that um, uh, sometimes when we talk about pipelines, we don't pay enough attention to the fact that we construct them. Mm -hmm. That is to say, if we could say, look, uh, there isn't um, uh, a thick pipeline of uh, students who we want to enter STEM fields, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, but that pipeline isn't fully formed. That pipeline, if I'm at an institution um, and I'm thinking about students, that pipeline is gonna be informed by, well, what's my admissions criteria? Because my admissions cri criteria is gonna make that pipeline thin or thick. Mm -hmm. What's my recruitment efforts? Because my recruitment effort is gonna make that pipeline thin or thick. What resources am I dishing out? Because what resources I'm dishing out is gonna make that pipeline thin or thick. What uh, demographic uh, um, makeup, do I have of the students or the faculty? Because that demographic makeup is going to attract students and therefore make the pipeline thin or thick. So our own institutional governance choices every day shape the pipelines that we sometimes describe as just out there. But we're constructing the pipelines in all of these ways, not fully to be <laughs> sure, but our choices shape the flow of students into our institutions. And when they get 
to our institutions, how we teach them, what the curriculum looks like, what sort of support we offer us affect their pipeline into STEM. So mm-hmm. we play a significant role creating quote unquote pipelines that are not just already out there. We structure them as well. Um, so that leads me to this question of intersectionality and what actually drives the conversation. Why is the intersection of maleness and whiteness driving our analysis and not the intersection of being a woman or a person of color? And I think you touched on that in your presentation, but I just want to resurface that a bit more. I mean, I think that in some ways that just asks um, a question about uh, how institutions were initially set up and who were imagined to be the proper subjects of institutions and who were the quintessential students, who were the quintessential faculty members mm-hmm. and who were the you know, uh, quintessential um, authority figures. And, you know, the history is such that we know that the quintessential professor is not a woman, was not a woman. Uh, mm-hmm. The quintessential um, student uh, was not black, et cetera, and so forth. So we continue to um, uh, push forward in ways that reflect progress, but against that history. So that history just doesn't just disappear. It's one that, that lives on. And one of the reasons we sometimes turn to social psychology and discourses around different forms of bias is to demonstrate that even when we're not consciously, again, articulating these things out loud, we can show that you know, we associate men with the sciences much more robustly than we associate women with the sciences. Uh, we associate men with the math more than we associate women with math, et cetera, and so forth. And we can tell that story uh, about race as well. So in some ways we inherit uh, those assumptions. Um, they operate as defaults, which mm-hmm. is why we have to be very intentional in seeking the kind of um, inclusive environments that we want. Thank you for that, because that also opens um, another pathway for a question associated with the current national conversation, which has been um, political, making CRT very political in national conversations. And even in our state, where um, we've had some legislation passed recently that will prohibit the teaching of what is characterized as divisive topics and things of that nature. But clearly there is a concern around um, how the history of this country and the history of other things like say, for example, the history of higher education and how that unfolded, the history of education and how that unfolded. Um, As a professor, what advice would you offer to faculty who have concerns about the ways in which um, these policies might affect their interest in teaching or working through certain topics? And certainly I think that intersectionality would be at the core of some of this. I mean, I think the the reality is that many of these um, subject matters uh, are um, already Uh, deeply connected to what is supposedly um, off the table. I mean, it's it's pretty hard uh, in my own discipline to teach um, and not discuss segregation, for example. That's Mm -hmm. just, you you cannot teach constitutional law and not, for example, discuss segregation. That's just something you have to discuss. And I think um, other uh, disciplines have versions of that. So the question in some ways becomes, you know, to what extent does um, engaging with the truth about history um, structure the pedagogical approach that you take? And the answer is that it should structure the pedagogical approach uh, that you take. And the key is to have um, institutions um, ensure that, you know, academic freedom values are being rehearsed, that people recognize that this if nothing else, is a hit on academic freedom. And that, that's a core value that people across uh, different ideological positions tend to agree with. And so if even on that narrow frame, 
uh, one gets to do the work that one wants to do, then um, that is uh, clearly an improvement on the current condition. The mm -hmm. other is to make people understand um, the importance of the topic for the discipline in which one is situated. So again, I can easily demonstrate why you can't understand law without uh, discussing um, the segregation, including Plessy to Brown, that I can't not talk about race and teach mm -hmm. those cases. I think part of what we have to do is to reveal why one cannot talk about sociology, philosophy, history, et cetera, uh, without uh, taking up um, these topics. That's not always um, a conversation that people comfortably want to have, but it's one that I think we are responsible for um, modeling. Great, thank you very much. Um, are there others who have questions or um, thoughts associated with our discussion this morning? Well, it looks like we're going to um, end this section. Uh, of, I have one question. I I'm just sorry. Want, I'm sorry. Too. That's okay. Uh, my question has to do with the reference. I, you know, what you said was very interesting, and uh, it really addresses a lot of concerns we have in terms of recruitment and retention in STEM disciplines, and some of the things that we've experienced earlier and things that we inherited that are that are affecting our pipeline. I just wondered if you had some particular references uh, that we I could further explore. You could send those so that we can, I can get a can continue to uh, learn more about that and the impact on our pipelines. Because we are having a, a difficult time across all of our higher educational institutions in terms of retention. Mm -hmm. And that's something we've got to address. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's a really critical issue. I know I just um, uh, received a, a document from a colleague, um, John Williams, who does uh, terrific work on gender and work and has for a long time been trying to understand the uh, different ways in which um, barriers uh, get in the way of um, women across race and class ascending different kind of employment opportunities. She talked about, for example, the maternal law, uh, flexible work, um, life balance or, or not. And she's just issued a report, which I will get your way, that focused specifically on women um, uh, in STEM fields. So it's not, so it's looking at, you know, what happens to women in these particular domains. And part of the emphasis on the fact that yes, it's a pipeline problem, but it turns out that when women are actually in these fields, they experience uh, various forms of exclusion that means, or bias that, that means that their trajectories are uh, circumscribed as, as, as a result of that. So it tries to map all the ways in which a woman might find herself in a STEM field um, so she's part of the pipeline and she gets there, so to speak. But um, that um, position is compromised because of various forms of bias. And she focuses specifically on um, the ways in which women of color in particular um, confront these obstacles over and against, say, uh, white women and uh, black men, uh, men of color. And she's not suggesting that white women or men of color have it easy in, in any sense, but she's trying to expose the particular vulnerabilities that um, uh, women of color might have and come up and comes up with what, what she perceives to be some useful um, intervention. So I'm happy to um, share that document. I don't recall the nature of the report, but it quite literally just came out yesterday. Okay, I would love to have that. I'll be sure to send it. Great. Thank you again, Dr. Cabado. And if you would um, be so kind to share the document with um, Holly Holiday Jones, we can distribute it to our PIs and others um, in this session this morning. Well, I really appreciate um, you for joining us again this morning, for sharing with us. Um, and we will um, now pause for our break. We have a, about a 10 to 15 minute break, I think it is. And we will be returning, it's 10 minutes. Um, we will be returning in 10 minutes for our panel discussion 
that will feature our co-PI, so stay tuned. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Ciao. I had to go hybrid. And um, so a lot of what we did, most of the activities occurred in a um, remote setting. Collaborating with Auburn University and its includes project. And then finally, of course, Robin has been working diligently to capture our progress and, re and evaluate the programs as we've moved forward. I would like to now um, turn this part of the um, Symposium over to Dr. Ag, who's going to facilitate our panel. Good morning, everyone. I'm excited about our panel that we're going to have today. And we're gonna hear from each of our co-PIs who are gonna to talk to us about our institutional strategies for change. And like Dr. Dilworth just discussed, we have been doing many of this, our activities virtually, but they have been, um, you'll see quite robust. And I think that we've actually had um, some, some really big gains as a result of what we've been able to accomplish over the last few years. We're gonna start off with our first um, panelist who will be Dr. Esther Siswam. She's a co-PI at Miles College and she's an associate professor for biology and the, and the biology coordinator for natural science and mathematics at Miles College. Following, uh, and, we'll, and then after that, we will hear from Dr. Jeanette Jones at Alabama a and &M, and we'll go from there. So Dr. Siswam. Thank you very much, Dr. Ag, and good morning, everybody. Uh, we are very pleased to uh, share the report of Miles College Advanced Program today, and I hope that you can see my screen. Could you yeah. see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, awesome, awesome. So uh, like um, Dr. Ag mentioned, I'm standing in for her since uh, she's moderating today. So um, since the, uh, um, the objectives have been established, I'm going to just go ahead and share just the highlights of the Mars College uh, Advanced Program. I'm gonna set my own timer there. Okay, so we started in the grant in 2019, as you all know, and um, Dr. Antonia Adadova was then the current um, PI for um, Advanced at Miles College. And then later she handed over to Dr. Ag. And so this is our current team uh, that we have been operating out of uh, since 2021. Uh, this is Dr. Uh, A.G., myself, uh, Dr. Wesley, and Dr. Um, Charles Wood, who is the chair of the STEM, and this is our administrative assistant, uh, Ms. Paula Brown. So um, the, the, the objectives are the same as all of us have been uh, pursuing, which is to increase the participation and advancement of women in academic science, to increase uh, gender equity and seek those systemic uh, changes that pose a barrier to the progress of uh, especially the women. And uh, so we are looking for removal of uh, organizational barriers and increase participation and enhancement of uh, women in academic science. So uh, I'm going to present just based on the goals and I will mention each goal and just say how, what progress we have made in that direction. Uh, the first one here is to establish and operate an advanced office. And at Miles, we have executed that uh, objective. And you can see at the top right here, there's a banner um, for the um, Miles College Advance. We have that posted on, uh, on the front of that office and we have all of the advanced um, gadgets and equipment uh, situated in this office. This office overlooks the running of the affairs of advance uh, out of the Dean of Academic Affairs office. And we have a new space moving in uh, to the Learning Resource Center, which is the new renovated uh, building that we have. So uh, our second goal was to um, 
to establish an, ex, an advisory body or committee that oversees uh, and guides the affairs of the grant. Uh, Dr. Charles C. Wood uh, is the head of that. Dr. Benaga, who is the professor at Miles College, is part of, a, of that. And Dr. Cunningham is also part of the advisory board. Dr. Mishra had um, retired. So we have these three people who are now uh, members of the advisory board for the advanced grant. So our third goal was focused on training. And this is training of the STEM chairs, uh, the search committee and the promotion and tenure committee. So we um, focus on training these groups in areas of gender equity and uh, then uh, increasing the number of women that participate in the promotion and tenure committee. So all of those uh, have been in place. We achieved the training to installing uh, seminars and workshop, and I will share a few of those uh, with you uh, in the next slides. So uh, to address um, gender equity, or equity in diversity and equity in STEM, we brought a panel of uh, invited speakers who address different topics for us. Uh, on the board here, you can see uh, Dr. Thompson addressed unconscious bias. Uh, Dr. Schneider spoke to us on equal pay and equal work. And uh, Dr. Lihan spoke on leadership in STEM. So uh, along that uh, theme, we also uh, had uh, Dr. Banaga of Miles College speak to us on benchmarking of women in higher education. So uh, to crown that, we had an, um, an open house where we had the opportunity to bring everybody in, show them the goals and the purpose of ADVANCE and what ADVANCE is doing at Miles College. So this event was attended uh, by all the faculty. And by the way, all of these events, most of the times are attended by almost all of the faculty body at Miles College. So uh, the next uh, was addressing the, prom the promotion and tenure uh, committee training. And to that effect, we had Dr. Adadevo, Antonia Adadevo have um, ad um, mount a, a workshop in 2019 uh, that addressed all the promotion and tenure requirements at Miles College, and all of Miles faculty attended this um, event. Uh, we also had Dr. Uh, Foster Peary of the Petersburg uh, College, St. Petersburg College, come to address us on best practices in recruitment and retention of women minorities. Uh, our goal number four, objective number four, was to implement spouse partner relocation policies at Mars College. And uh, the advanced team worked together with the HR uh, director and the administration to, uh, in, to put this uh, policy in place. So right now we have a document uh, containing the recommendations before the president who is going to put it to the board of trustees for approval. Uh, goal number five was to establish a mentoring program for STEM faculty. So for this, we installed, uh, we instituted two big programs. One of them was the senior, uh, the uh, seminar series, which we call the Science Friday series at Mars College uh, once a month. And then we have, we, we formed a new uh, organization of STEM faculty that we call the STEM Women Faculty Network Forum. So this was meant to directly address the issues uh, regarding faculty development uh, and professional development among women, because our data suggested that uh, women were kind of behind in terms of faculty ranking at Miles College. We also um, had um, faculty awards where um, a STEM faculty could, could get some uh, a, amount of money to carry out research towards that goal. And we also had a vote for travel and conference attendance. So um, to achieve uh, this professional development, we had different speakers speak to us on different uh, topics. Uh, one of them was um, balancing work and family life, which was taken by uh, Dr. Carson from UAB. Then we have mentoring of women uh, and minorities, uh, which was taken by Dr. Jeanette Jones from Alabama A&M. 
And then we have navigating um, the conferences and professional societies, uh, which was uh, taken by um, other uh, speakers. So um, to also towards that, we organized special workshops on grant writing. Uh, one of those was uh, taken by Dr. Banaga and myself from Miles College, and then also collaboration and team building, which was taken by Dr. Pendamani from UAB. We also had a workshop among the STEM women faculty and a network forum that uh, specifically addressed issues of or barriers to uh, productivity of STEM women in the academic, academic field. Our last goal was um, to have a, a program where the, the students can interface uh, with faculty and also work on uh, advanced grant activities. So uh, we call that the uh, STEM Research Scholar Program. And, to, and for that, we were able to deliver three major things uh, during the program. Uh, one of them was summer research internships where we were able to provide internship directly to our students from Mars campus in 2020. And then we have had a scholar research and presentation showcases. The first one was in 2020, and then we have one coming just tomorrow. And then this is the update of our data, our STEM data or ranking before and at the current time. So at the left, we have uh, faculty data from 2019, and then on the right, we have 2022. So the difference between the two um, charts is that we have, we have uh, improved or increased the number of professors who have moved to associate ranks uh, uh, from, from the time that we had the grant. And we know that more promotions are in the pipeline, so this data might even get better in the short time. So our, our advanced website is in the making. We had it up, but it was down because the overall website is under renovation. So we're gonna have this back in, in a short while. So in summary, these are the things that we believe Mass College Advanced has achieved. We established the office, we have the training, uh, we've been training the, um, the committees and we've had a lot of professional development activities. We have scholar research engagement with the students and then we are looking now at new directions. And this chart here shows us just the, how much the program has been received at Mars College and the faculty have been very enthusiastic in attending these programs. So now thank you um, for your attention and we'll take the questions when the time comes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Siswam. And we're really excited about the, uh, the strides that we've been able to make at Mass College and definitely with you as a co-PI is a, a big part of our success. So I think we're gonna have our questions at the, the very end for all, all well, um, I can't see the chat or anything like that. Let me see if I can see it. Okay, so, um, okay, we're good here. I'm going to move on to the, our next panelist, who will be Dr. Jeanette Jones, and she is the PI for Alabama a and University. Thank you very much, Dr. Aggie. Uh, here's the information. Uh, the next slide, please. We're very fortunate at Alabama A&M and, and very proud to be a part of this um, advanced group. Uh, we selected Dr. Daniel Wims, the 12th president of Alabama A&M University. Uh, he um, served as, serves as the chair of our advanced team. And so we were very proud that he had spent three years with us and he's very familiar with all of the issues that we have try, been trying to address uh, through the advanced grant. On our campus, we have about 5,197 undergraduates and 800 plus graduate students giving us a total of about 6,314 
faculty and we operate under four colleges. The next slide, please. We established in initially, uh, as we described in the grant, an office for advance. Uh, that office has been functioning since our year one. Next slide. This is our advanced team. We have a team of accomplished women in biology, food science, chemistry, social work and behavioral sciences and physics. And that is a very dynamic team working very closely into disciplinary approach. Next slide. This is a summary of the activities uh, featuring the items and things that we have focused on for the past three years establishing the office where we, uh, the faculty uh, uh, interact with the team and we focus on in issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion and provide resources. We began to compile data for STEM uh, analysis and so that we can approach our problems with from a database uh, um, background. We created and monitored uh, our advanced website uh, that's been very put in place since year one. We created an advisory council uh, that includes individuals from academia, industry, governmental partners, so that they can uh, provide and help us with solutions to the problems we've identified. And the advanced presentations have been uh, given to our board of trustees because if we are to get transformation uh, have transformational change, we have to start with our governing board and work work down or work both ways uh, in terms of instituting uh, change. Uh, I serve as an ex, ex officio member of the board of trustees, so I have an opportunity to do that when I make my presentations. We presented also to UAB during the uh, symposium that we have held over the last two years and prepared a number of advanced activities uh, that have been showcased to our stakeholders throughout the campus and our partners in the advanced group. And uh, we are currently in the midst of a, a diversity, equity, and inclusion climate survey, climate survey at least, uh, to determine what are some of the issues measuring satisfaction levels for our faculty, staff, and students. Next slide. Uh, we have completed a number of uh, workshops and you can see by the numbers, year one, two, and three, the ones that we focus on in terms of mentoring, intersectionality, promotion and tenure, unconscious bias, civic engagement, work-life balance, and leadership. Uh, you can see that uh, we try to address those issues that we've heard discussed this morning and, and to try to uh, provide some uh, training and information to the faculty, staff, and students. As you know, we want to, we're addressing the pipeline issue, not only for faculty, but also, also for uh, students. And so those workshops have been very effective. Next slide. Uh, in collaboration with our partners in the advanced group, uh, we collaborated jointly with Oakwood uh, University during Women's History Month in year one to focus on STEM careers, research showcase, and charting a course for the future for our students and for young faculty who are met, we are mentoring. And so we, we be, really believe that's been very impactful. Uh, we focused on women in STEM leadership, and we had several guest speakers to come from industry in the state legislature. Dr. Uh, uh, Representative Laura Hall is a biologist by training, so she shared a lot of her information, and so was so did Dr. Laffenhaus. We shared experiences to uh, from with our students to celebrate women in STEM leadership to see what they're doing how they started and how they got there to the leadership positions they've had in industry and business. Uh, we, the, we showcased our students' um, research and that was really a big hit because it showed 
the community and the campus community, especially what our female students are doing in terms in the laboratories in, in areas where uh, they don't really know that students excel in physics and chemistry and mathematics and some of the other areas. So we and that was a big hit and we're doing it every year. And we acknowledge uh, their accomplishments by giving them awards and special medals. Uh, so you see at the bottom, we total about the first year, six workshops, 20 the second year, and, and nine with a total of 35 workshops. So we created that awareness and acknowledgement of successful strategies to recruit and retain women in STEM. Although there are some holes in the pipeline, we believe that we are, we are, getting, we are getting somewhere. Next slide. These are some of the outcomes. We, we, we believe we're seeing institutional change in practices and policies that have inhibited gender equity and inclusion. Uh, we've looked at what's happening. We're trying to, in terms of just stopping the tenure clock for special situations that we had with the pandemic, what we have with uh, in family situations that come about spousal relocation policies that are under review and being discussed with the Board of Trustees. We've increased the representation of women and other minorities groups in STEM departments uh, through educational training. Many men attend the workshops that we have and with the training and adoption of relevant policies and practices. Uh, we offer practices on search committee training and making sure that each of the committees are uh, fairly or uh, equally repre have representation of females. Improve recruitment retention of diverse faculty and staff uh, in a promotion and tenure process. That's where we are really uh, putting a focus because uh, our data shows that we don't have, we have, we are lacking in the number of women that are being promoted at the professoral level. And it's a real concern to me. And so we're really putting folks there to see what's happening there. One of the problems is the, is the University Promotion and Tenure Committee. When you look at the constitution of it, uh, women are not fairly represented. And so we are really hitting that one. We've increased interdisciplinary collab collaboration through acceptance and inclusion. We have a lot of uh, meetings in which we are getting individuals across the disciplines to work together. That helps women uh, in, in some areas, even going into education, working with the women in science to increase and improve their portfolios so that they can get promoted and increased awareness of barriers, assessment of policies and practices and procedures and adoption of strategies that inhib inhibit uh, biases and promote equity and inclusion. So those advanced workshops have had an impact and we are continuing with those as many as we can, we can get approved. Next slide. And these are some of the current activities. Um, uh, I'm trying to rush through this. Uh, we are perfecting, we're trying to make sure we um, deliver effectively uh, information during our workshop. So we're trying to perfect that. Uh, make it better than we started out doing. We want to continue to review and adopt strategies to focus on con uh, unconscious bias and promote equity. We got ongoing training, mentoring, um, the promotion and tenure policies. We're looking at that one with a keen eye. Uh, we are continue to highlight our faculty and staff. We created um, a magazine that focuses on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So sometimes uh, people are doing great things, but they are hidden in the publicity that is released university-wide. So we, we've created our own magazine for that. And we have an ongoing review of the data. We need to keep our eyes on the data. The data is dropping in some areas and it's increasing in other areas. So we wanna keep our eyes on it to make sure uh, that uh, things don't go backwards. As we move forward, we don't want to take any steps backwards and we want to utilize the experts that we have access to. So we're comparing the uh, data baseline and we're looking at our climate survey. Next slide. 
Uh, these are some of the things we're doing. We're going to focus on the intersectionality. I really enjoyed the presentation today. It's, it gives me more encouragement and inspiration to move forward with that. We want to continue to solicit resources for our advanced office, not just from this grant. We wanted to leverage the funds that we're getting from this grant uh, through the university and through other grants stuff, so that we can build on the activities and expand on the activities that we have underway. Our internal advisory council uh, is very effective. We want to also have an external advisory council to assist us uh, in leveraging the resources. We're going to update and provide recommendations to administration, the board of trustees regarding our goals and objectives. And we're going to update and distribute our best practices through meetings like we have today. Next slide. And finally, if there are questions, uh, you may contact me. That's the view of View for Campus of Alabama a and Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. I got a lot out of your session, um, including looking at a keen eye. So you're looking at a keen eye for the policies. And uh, my keen eye skipped Dr. Paulette uh, Dilworth from University of Alabama, Birmingham, our PI there. Um, and so I'm gonna ask Dr. Dilworth, I'm gonna have you to present um, now. Thank you. Uh, great, that, no worries. Thank you so much. Again, um, it's exciting to see all of you and especially exciting to see, um, to hear the sessions from our co-PIs in terms of the progress that they've been making on their respective um, institutions. I'd like to begin by first um, recognizing the three people who basically have been the engine behind the work that we're doing here at UAB. Um, they really don't need to be introduced to you, but I'd like to start by uh, referencing Dr. Lewis Dale, who is our project director and a co-PI for the advanced project, and then Dr. Carolyn Braswell, who is also a co-PI on the program, um, and both are supposedly semi-retired, retired, I'm not sure what they call it, but um, they've been very busy making sure that we go as we should, and uh, Ms. David Daniels Carter has been um, providing the admin support along with Holly Holiday Jones and um, Ashley Aldrich, who are our communications team, basically um, had it not been for all of these people coming together, especially when we had to pivot during the pandemic. Um, I think that um, it goes without saying that we actually had a seamless experience. And I am really amazed at a lot of the things that we've been able to accomplish um, thus far. But just to sort of begin um, to look back at the beginning where we came from, um, UAB was awarded the NSF Advanced Grant back in 20, we started the year, I think it was 2019. Um, the goal was to work on focus on achieving gender equity in STEM. Uh, the grant award was 1.2, 2.5 million. Uh, and we start with our six partner institutions um, here. Um, you've heard from Miles College and you've heard from uh, Alabama A&M University. Um, Auburn University serves as a partner in that they have an includes grant which focuses specifically on working with um, individuals with disabilities. And the idea is to think about ways in which um, the includes grant focuses on ensuring that they too have an opportunity to advance in STEM fields as well. And then our remaining partners, the University of Alabama at Huntsville and Oakwood University as well. All have been really great partners to work with. And we, as I said, continue to look forward to the opportunity to work with them. Um, just to, to give sort of an overview of, of what we have, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one slide. Um, we had to establish an advanced advisory board. And for those of you who may not um, be familiar, I just wanted to um, share who these individuals are. Dr. Carla, Carla Jackson Bell is currently the Dean of the School of Architecture at Tuskegee University. Nicole Riddle is here at UAB as an Associate Professor of Biology. Melody Russell is a Professor of Science Education at Auburn University. Dr. Lisa Schriebert is the Interim Dean of the Graduate School, but she's also faculty here in the School of Medicine and she's a, um, I'm sorry, biomedical 
Biomedical Sciences, I believe it is. Virginia Cicio Piku is a professor in the School of Engineering, and they've all been great supporters of our work and have actually, um, we have a meeting scheduled with them next week. Um, just to, to sort of rehash some of the work that we've done as um, a way to advance um, the conversation around advance. Our first symposium in, um, was um, scheduled back in uh, September of 2020. And our speaker for that symposium was Dr. Shirley Malcolm. Um, it was a great session. Dr. Malcolm um, provided uh, great insight, um, sort of sh um, sharing her own story in terms of her own trajectory into uh, the field. And um, it was very well received as the evaluations that um, Robin shared with us showed us. Um, and then our spring symposium featured Dr. Freeman Habrowski. And I think, again, this uh, person goes without, doesn't need introduction. It was a fabulous session as well and was very well received. Just sort of a summary of other activities that we've hosted here included the underrepresentation of women. We invited Dr. Um, War Warwick from Stillman College. She's the president of St Stillman College. Her session was very well received as well. We wanted to include um, HBCUs as a perspective to consider the relevance of HBCUs and STEM education. That session featured Dr. Marsha Owens, who also has an advanced program at Florida a &M University. And then of course, um, Ansley Abraham, who is the executive director of the Southern um, Education Foundation. And um, those sessions also were very well perceived, received. I won't rehash um, all of the information here other than to say that I think that um, the work that we're doing is making a difference. We've had some successes around some of the um, work associated with our search committee guidelines that we implemented last year. We're now here at UAB. Every search committee has to go through search committee training that focuses on unconscious bias, microaggressions. And um, also um, we've had some success with um, working directly with department chairs and bringing them up to speed on the process associated with search committees. Because as Dr. Jones indicated, one of the challenges for um, this work activity is associated with faculty recruitment in particular and faculty recruitment in STEM, and then the capacity of the institution to retain them. And I think that as we move forward, that will, for us, will become another priority working collaboratively, co collaboratively with our, um, we have a DEI subcommittee now of the Faculty Senate. And one of the things that they began to address has to do with DEI um, issues associated with the tenure promotion process. And um, I would just say, stay tuned and hopefully we'll have some good news to share at our next symposium. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer questions at the end of the session. Thank you, Dr. Dilworth. We're now going to move on to Dr. Ken Lahing, uh, the PI for Oakwood University. Okay. I'm uh, Ken Lahing at Oakwood University. Our president is Dr. Leslie Pollard, and our provost is Dr. James Mbrukuro. Our uh, co-PIs uh, from the Chair of Biology, Dr. Elaine Vanderpool. Uh, we have Vice President Karen Ben Marshall. Uh, our Chair of Mathematics and Computer Science is Dr. Lisa James. Dr. Patrick O'Cheng is the Chair of uh, Chemistry. And our Program Assistant is Ms. Brianna Marshall. So the impact uh, of the advanced grant on, uh, on at Oakwood is for the institution to take a look at itself and look at the policies as it relates to gender and equity um, uh, and work-life balance uh, with faculty. So we do this through a series of seminars, discussions, um, and workshops. So we at OCA, we established the advanced office uh, we did work workshops on rank, promotion and rank. We did work-life balance seminars. 
And of course, we had um, Unconscious Biases Symposium with Dr. David Williams. Uh, and another one of the things that we did was to have um, uh, a, his consultation with uh, Dr. David um, Williams. Uh, we planned to, uh, and hosted two Unconscious Bias Symposia with Dr. David Williams. These are a few of the, the, um, the flyers that we sent out. We made sure we had flyers for all of the uh, programs. And as you can see, uh, they were shared also with different institutions, Alabama A&M and UH um, collaborated with us on several of, of these, uh, especially with Dr. Uh, David Williams. And we had quite a few of these during the school year in addition to the workshops. So COVID-19 played a big role in uh, our presentations prior to, um, to 2020. We had to go virtual and most of you um, have been doing your seminars virtually. Uh, so on one of them, we had a Zoom bomber who took over our screen and it was not a pleasant um, event at, at that point. So we had to change our meeting room and this in, um, it allowed our uh, the people on the, on the meeting to become focused as to what we were doing and the importance of it. The specific objectives uh, of our program related to promotion and rank workshops. We held these for our faculty. We did work-life balance seminars, right? Um, looking at the mental, physical, and spiritual aspect of, um, of, of, of our faculty. We had unconscious bias symposium. We had conversations with the administration and we did this also with Alabama A&M and uh, UOH. And we had uh, workshops on institutional policies. During the academic school year, we held um, 16 virtual events. Um, the Vance Grants hosted a second installment of David uh, Williams. We discussed facility uh, and facilitated a healthy conversation with that. And overall, um, the, the program has been working very well. I'd like to add that uh, the faculty um, at Oakwood, we increased the, the number of uh, female faculty who were promoted from assistant professor to associate professor. We uh, established our uh, advanced um, office. We are working with the faculty senate to to, uh, to revise our hiring policies and also the faculty handbook. And so we're doing quite a few things at Oakwood to, um, to assist with the advanced grant. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lying. And now we will hear from Dr. Judith Schneider, PI for University of Alabama in Huntsville. Um, but UAH is a research intensive university. We're in Huntsville, Alabama, and we're just across town from Oakwood and AM. Next slide, please. This is our advanced team. Uh, Judy Schneider is the PI at UAH. I'm a, a, a co PI, uh, I'm the current chair of the computer science department. Uh, Rhonda Gady is uh, uh, another co PI, she's interim associate provost at the, at the moment. Uh, Brenda Youngblood is our academic affairs specialist and Sebastian is the young man we've hired to work for us. Next slide, please. Our internal executive committee uh, consists of uh, the, the dean of uh, basically three deans. The, dean of, the, the first two people we signed up were the dean of engineering and the dean of uh, science, uh, Dr. Shankar Mahalingam and Dr. Reiner Steinwatt. Uh, but the Dean of uh, Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences had a background working with advanced grants, so he wanted to work with us. And in addition, our, our interim provost, Bob Lindquist, is uh, uh, on this, and also our VP for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Laterica Shelton. Next slide, please. 
we, we have a, a website uh, that, that's located on the UAH Academic Affairs page out of the provost's office. Um, and uh, uh, we have a, a lot of information there. We're talking about, uh, we have lots of information about um, everything we're doing and um, a, a lot of the events we've had and that kind of thing. Um, next slide, please. Um, in year one, uh, we started with a, uh, a, a, um, a research collaboration seminar. Um, the idea was to do a um, uh, uh, like a it's like speed dating, research dating. <laughs> we went with that with Oakwood and us. Uh, then in February, we had the directory director of the Invention Innovation Center. Uh, they're they're very they're very much tasked with. Uh, um, uh, starting small businesses and that kind of thing. They, they gave us a talk. Then we had a lessons learned from tenure denial of the, uh, and the planned forward. We had a, a seminar about that. And then COVID hit. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. So year two, we had to do everything uh, virtually. In January, our, our PI, Dr. Schneider, talked to my, Miles College on equal pay for equal work. In February, we had a, vote, a, a virtual seminar um, about elements of leadership. And then in uh, March, we participated in the Alabama Spring Symposium. Then in April of 2021, we had a, uh, the Tennessee Tech Provost come and talk to us about mentors. That one in particular was very well received. Next slide, please. Uh, last October, we moved, well, last fall, we moved back to in-person meetings. And last fall, we had two um, uh, pairs of couples from the computer science and engineering department at Mississippi State University. They had recently retired from there, but it was dual uh, couples, uh, um, uh, husband and wives who worked for the same department. And they talked to us about how they had gotten their jobs in the same department. Well, I guess one of them, two of them were in the computer science department. One was in another department, pardon me. Dr. Bob and Reese, Donna Reese were in the same computer science and engineering department. Dr. Bridges was in the computer science and engineering department. And Phil Bridges was in mechanical engineering there, I believe. But they talked to us about um, all the issues they've had through the years, the things that had to deal with, how they managed to get their jobs in the first place. Uh, in December, we had a uh, student fac faculty mixer and our new interim president came in and spoke to us. Uh, in March, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we, we, we had a, an NSF seminar on research opportunities. I'm, I'm gonna talk to the, about that a little bit more in a minute. And uh, next April, this, this, well, this April, <laughs> uh, uh, Soon, next week, we're going to have a uh, presentation on the importance of mentoring relationships. Next slide, please. So this is our student faculty mixer. We had a good bit of participation. Uh, that's, our, that's our interim president. And um, we uh, had lunch and we talked about all kinds of issues. Next slide. This is our NSF seminar that we recently um, um, completed. Um, we, uh, um, she talked about uh, opportunities for early career investigators as well as uh, other um, possible other other programs for faculty at different stages of their careers. Uh, she she joined us virtually, but we had a lot of people here in person. Uh, we had lots of faculty from AAMU uh, and Alabama A&M came over. I think it was like 14 faculty. And a lot of our faculty came and we, we introduced people. We're hoping to get some good research out of that. Uh, next fall, we're planning to have another NSF uh, or one or more NSF uh, meetings where people have possibilities of talking to NSF program directors about individual research in like breakout sessions. We're working on that. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, some of the things that have happened in um, our department and our university this last year. Uh, Dr. Ting Ting Wu got, uh, became an, he got promotion and tenure. Uh, Dr. Lori Joyner, she received the Distinguished Teaching Award. Dr. Vanitha Mimon, she's in my department. 
uh, she's an assistant professor here. She won the IEEE Outstanding Young Professional Award, and she also got an Early Career Fellowship Award from the National Academies of Science. Dr. Sharifa Love Rutledge, who is an assistant professor in chemistry, was named as one of the 1,000 inspiring black scientists by Cell Mentor. Um, and she's working with an AA, uh, American Association of University Women Fellowship for Empowering Women and Girls. Dr. Coleman Schultz in the chemistry department was named 20, a, a um, fellow by the American Chemistry Society. And in leadership, I, I became the first female chair of the UAH computer science department. And Dr. Samson Golson became the first black chair of the industrial, engin industrial engineering and engineering management department. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a, a socials every, uh, the fourth Thursday of every month. We've been doing this this last year. Um, we meet in the, because of COVID, we started meeting in the park and, and outside at a, at a picnic table near the parking lot. And uh, um, we just continued that as uh, COVID got better. We, we do that. That's our little advanced team, smaller. That's, well, it's a varying number of people that show up. That was who showed up that particular day. Next slide, please. I guess that's it. Um, I'll be glad to answer any questions at the end here. I apologize for the slide problems. You're just fine. We're, we're great on time and you did a great job and the, the information that you had to share was timely and relevant and helps us to understand what's great things are happening at UAH. So everything is great. Okay. So thanks. now we're going to move to Dr. Robin Taylor, who's going to talk to us about program evaluation. And please put your questions if you have any questions in the Q and A um, for our any of our panelists, because immediately following her presentation, we will accept questions. Dr. Well, well, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm Robin Taylor, Principal and Senior Evaluator for Artris Consulting, which is an evaluation business to help STEM programs grow through data-driven evidence. Program evaluation is a systematic process of collecting information about a program to better understand the program, to improve program effectiveness, to make informed decisions about future programming, and also to demonstrate program impact. The evaluation focus for the Alabama Advanced Partnership includes focus on process evaluation, collecting information for how a program is working, and then outcome evaluation, examining changes that are a result of um, the program. An important step in the evaluation planning process is to help projects achieve a unified vision of how their activities relate to the project goals and objectives. This logic model was used as an outline for mapping the NSF supported Alabama Advanced Partnership and organizes and illustrates the goals of the program, the key activities and strategies to address these goals and includes details for what information would need to be collected and useful to understand program outputs and outcomes. Changing the historical underrepresentation of persons who have been typically excluded within STEM education and careers is complex, with many causal mechanisms impacting successful recruitment and retention practices. While a logic model does not capture this complexity, it can serve as a condensed overview for the needs and issues being addressed and how short-term short outcomes can be observed where short-term outcomes are those immediate effects of a program such as changes in awareness, attitudes, knowledge, or skills. These short-term changes can then are then expected or believed to impact additional outcomes such as changes in behavior, which are more likely to be observed after some time has passed. And these intermediate changes are then hoped and believed to address long-term outcomes and impacts such as changes in the values, norms, conditions, or organizational and system-wide policies and structures, which then should address the program goals and thus the problem statement that motivated the need for the program. A key evaluation question I use to understand programs is to what extent has the pro project accomplished their goals and objective? and what information is available to support the accomplishment of each objective. A key, act, a, <clears throat> a key activity and objective for the Alabama Advanced Partnership Grant was to establish advanced offices at each institution 
This activity has been met as each partnership institution has a key set of PIs, principal investigators, and co-PIs who work together to support the planning and implementation of program activities. Each has a team that has, um, each team has utilized funds to support at least partially a program manager position to coordinate many of the administrative tasks for implementing different project activities. Each campus has dedicated space for their advanced office, have signage or will have signage for their space, have marketed advance through promotional outlets such as flyers, new newsletters, magazines, and have created web pages for their advanced program. In addition, advisory boards have been utilized at several institutions to provide input to their advanced teams. Another significant outcome for the partnership will be to implement institutional changes and practices and policies that have inhibited gender equity within the hiring process and promotion processes. A current focus of the program and also the evaluation is to understand the hiring tenure and promotion policies, identify areas within policies or practice which may result in unconscious bias, and either change policies and procedures to eliminate potential bias or train leadership and search committees on how to recognize and avoid biases, which can adversely affect faculty based on characteristics related to their intersectionality of self. The advanced program has hosted numerous events across each campus to provide awareness and knowledge related to gender equity in STEM, related to barriers to equity of underserved populations, search committee guidelines, tenure and promotion guidelines, work and family balance, career development, and unconscious bias. With the onset of COVID, most events were moved to a virtual platform, which allowed the partnership to reach wider audiences for each presentation. Post surveys were used to allow participants to provide feedback on which topics they gained awareness or knowledge, to rate the events, and to provide open-ended feedback for the usefulness of the event and to provide suggestions for improving events. Overall, partnership events provided awareness and knowledge across all topic areas. Additionally, the majority of participants provided positive and satisfied feedback to these events. Open-ended feedback often included a recognition for gaining awareness and understanding of a topic, appreciation for the space to recognize these barriers and biases for persons typically excluded within STEM, and actionable, actionable changes participants hope to see within their selves or within their institutions. In addition to the seminars, Alabama Advanced Partnership envisioned hosting annual conferences each year of the grant to commune a wider audience and considering issues affecting the recruitment and retention of those who have been excluded from participating in STEM education and careers. The in-person symposium was canceled during the, the spring of 2020, but was rescheduled as a virtual event during the fall of 2020. And the second symposium was held during spring 2021. The first symposium featuring Dr. Shirley Malcolm and the second featuring Dr. Freeman Herbowski addressed numerous topics and each symposium was well received. As a quick side note, please know that I will be sending an event feedback survey in your inbox this afternoon to get input <clears throat> for today's symposium. So um, please provide that feedback because it does help the advanced leadership team understand participants' experiences for today and can help with future event planning. Advanced activities are intended to support the goal for increasing the representation and visibility of persons who have typically been excluded across STEM departments. Each advanced institution is encouraged to consider collecting data that supports understanding progress made towards this goal. Indicators include the tracking of number and percentages of women faculty by rank and department, number and percentages of women faculty in leadership positions, endowed named chairs, those that are receiving major campus awards, and those who serve on influential campus committees. Other indicators include tenure outcomes, attrition, understanding median salaries, and faculty offers made at the hiring level and startup packages. The stacked bar charts here have been compiled across all five of the advanced partnership institutions. The count of male versus female faculty members at each faculty rank, full professor, associate, and assistant professors are provided for the academic years 2018-19, 2019-20, and 2020-21. 
While there has been some traction with increasing the number of female faculty within the associate and full professor ranks, there are still gaps in representation, and the hope is that each institution will continue to see promotion of female faculty and underrepresented minority faculty members in higher ranks of associate and full professors as a result of advanced activities. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor, for that informative presentation. And now do we have any questions? I've been um, looking at the Q&A and I don't have um, any questions yet in the Q&A, but I wanted to start off with one of my own questions as a moderator. Um, Dr. Taylor, as you look at all of the colleges in the um, work we're doing here, uh, what do you think are kind of the, the, the things that Alabama is doing or that you've seen us do that you think is unique or some of our strengths um, with the, how we're rolling out the advanced grant and the projects? Uh, so strengths that I have observed um, is the partnership, the sharing across um, those that are involved in being able to learn across each other. I, I think it's very important to highlight the webinars. One of the most powerful pieces of information I got during site visits. So um, site visits, of course, were delayed as part of the evaluation for the advanced grant until this past fall and the beginning of the spring semester. But there was an individual faculty member that I spoke to and um, I wish I had been recording this individual because they indicated that they were attending the webinars and that the, the webinars were really giving voice to things that they were experiencing, but that they didn't feel like, they felt like if they brought up to those in leadership positions that they would be seen negatively. And so it allowed to open space to have discussions without um, them needing to feel uncomfortable. And so I, I definitely think that has been just a, a valuable component across each. Uh, the other thing I have noticed um, from feedback that has been received across uh, different components is uh, the introduction of having these opportunities for faculty in STEM and other faculty members across institutions to get together uh, really just allowed some um, activity across some of the institutions that that didn't have that before and that the faculty members were very excited to hope that these would keep continuing even after the advance grant was ended. Um, Dr. A.G. Ashley is here. Some people are saying that they can't post in the Q&A. Ashley, can you uh, give us some direction here? Yes. Uh, so the, the, the people who are attending can post in the Q&A for panelists. If we have, if you all have questions amongst yourselves, you can put those in the chat. So the Q&A okay. is just for attendees. Thank you. Um, and so, okay. So if any of the attendees have any questions, they can put them in the Q&A. That's what I was looking. Yeah. And then we, we, we have a question um, from Dr. Diario, Diario or um, Dr. Taylor. The question is, many of the partners indicated that the webinars or seminars were impactful, presumably, so pre presumably I don't know why I'm getting tug tied, on climate and culture. Is there a way to collect data on those changes? Uh, potentially, I think the, the one thing that's there is more of a qualitative study of the, the feedback that is provided. Um, I want to be careful how I how I think about this question that you asked. Uh, the the evaluation plan that was provided to each of the institutions talked about um, different ways that they could collect data, and one of the things that each of the institutions are encouraged to consider is a climate survey. Uh, and so they come in with differing levels and each institution uh, has different time periods in which this has been implemented or will be implemented. So that's, that's a way to gauge it. It's not part of the advanced evaluation except through encouragement. And I've always um, tried to be available to help how I can with respect to this information. I'm not sure I'm answering your question, 
but maybe, um, maybe I don't fully understand the question. I think you did uh, respond to the question and she said, got it. So that did respond to the question about how we're collecting data on uh, climate and culture. And I think that that was evidence in a, a study that we did at Miles, right, Dr. Saswam, where we asked the uh, professors about their experiences and if they felt like they could um, bring challenges to the forefront. So talk a, a little bit about the climate study that was done here at Miles College. Thank you, Dr. Angie. Uh, yes, so um, as part of just developing that component of the impact, um, or perceptions of the STEM faculty on what could be potential hindrances. Uh, we undertook some survey uh, research on uh, collecting the uh, ideas and you know, basically administering that questionnaire to STEM. Uh, first with the STEM Women Faculty uh, Network, which is the branch of Advanced at Mass College. And we had very interesting data um, kind of um, uh, address people identifying different items ranging from organizational barriers, uh, institutional, departmental, individual, personal, and um, resources and all of this. And they, uh, as they address those, and we are still um, analyzing that data. Dr. Taylor um, agreed to help us to analyze that data. And we try to expand that to include the males so that we can compare the males versus the female responses and even the entire institution. So we are hoping we're gonna have a mountain of data that we reveal a lot to us as far as how the faculty perceive what their potential um, barriers could be in each of the departments. Thank you so much. I'm gonna swing over to Alabama a and uh, for Dr. Jones. Could you tell us a little bit more about your magazine and what types of um, what you're putting out in the magazine that you have related to your advanced grant? Okay. Well, our magazine, um, thank you very much for that question first. Uh, we started out compiling the report. Dr. Dale asked us to submit an annual report. And so as we were compiling that, uh, the information, um, kept coming in and we were featuring um, highlights about women who were involved in our, our advanced team members and things they were doing and the things, uh, individuals who were working with them, the things they were doing. And so it kept growing. And, um, and so we eventually came up with the magazine. Uh, many of the things were, um, uh, were started or ins the inspiration for them was the results of things that we were doing on the, uh, the webinars and interactions with our colleagues. And we just got the inspiration to do more. And, and so we featured what women were doing, uh, the awards they received. Um, and as you compile it, you say, oh, we, we, we didn't know this. Uh, we didn't know this about the women on campus and the things that they were accomplishing, the research they were involved in, the organizations they were leading, the uh, professional organizations they were leading, and the recognition. And I think that's all a part of it. Also is the, the recognition of what women are doing. It helps the junior women who are in junior positions to reach you know, reach back to them and encourage them and, and bring them along the way. And, I, and often uh, the interaction we had, it helps you to feel that you're not isolated. Um, some women in physics, there's only one. <laughs> She's the department chair. She, she was promoted during, uh, well, there are two, but she's the tenure track one. And uh, so women in those areas where they're the only one or just few, uh, the magazine uh, just features them and it highlights them. And uh, we, can, we distribute it. So it's, it's around campus, it's among our trustees, and we shared it with uh, our leader, uh, lead institution, UAB. And, and so I think uh, that's what we should do. We've got to tell our story. And mm -hmm. all of us have a story, whether it's, uh, it's a short story or a long story, we need to that's tell right. it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Jones. So our, um, I'm sitting in on behalf of our president, Dr. Bob Knight, um, who is college and our first female president in the history of the college. Um, and she's a great champion for women for diversity. And she created our recreated a center for economic and social justice here at the college. I'm wondering if the other, any of the other panelists would like to share about other organizations or entities within the college that are outside of the advanced world that were very helpful and supportive in these processes. So I'm looking for any of the colleges and I'll just swing to Dr. Lying at Oakwood University. Talk to us about the types of support that you got from organizations around the college for your advanced grant. Uh, yes, um, at Oakwood, uh, we have several committees that work with, uh, with this, the faculty senate um, to uh, look at in inequalities um, as far as uh, not only STEM, but throughout the campus. Um, one of the things we, we do not have, we have a, a universal pay scale so that anyone at a given rank or a step gets the same salary, doesn't matter what area they're in. So that inequity, we do, we do, not, we do not have. However, we do have um, a challenge with number of, um, of female faculty at the higher ranks, uh, at the professor level. We, we are looking to solve that by um, this, within the past three years, we've had three new faculty members, two from biology, one from uh, math and computer science, who uh, moved from assistant professor to associate professor. And so the population uh, at the associate uh, professor level is increasing, but the, we are quite aware that um, it's, it's a challenge, especially with work-life work balance for for faculty, especially women in STEM, um, it's, it's quite a challenge trying to, to navigate the whole system. So we are working on ways to, to mm -hmm. the work-life balance. Thank you. We have another question in the chat and that question is for you, Dr. Taylor. Um, what has been the most surprising evidence to emerge from your evaluation of our advance? I don't. I don't think this would be surprising, although for me, it really showed um, the inequity that I think I was ignorant and blind to, but the, the disproportionate amount of resources to HBCUs versus uh, predominantly white institutions and research institutions. And the, the evidence for that was seen uh, in many ways based on the salaries and then the um, advancement and the uh, motivation to advance when it would they could easily move to the next um, level and rank, but it didn't mean that there was going to be an increase in salary and being rewarded for that. And so, to me, that was that was very enlightening and eye opening of um, an issue that that is very specific to certain institutions and it's going to be harder to address than just what advance can offer. Thank you for that answer. Dr. Escorn, am I saying it right? Yes. Yes, that was right. Okay, I kind of want to piggyback on that, that question. And uh, this is something that is happening nationwide and Miles College is experiencing it. To be able to get and retain amazing faculty members like Dr. Saswam here at our college, um, it's definitely a, a competition for great talent. So what are ways that the University of Alabama at Huntsville has addressed that in order to make sure that we do have this um, equity and representation in the STEM fields um, at your college? Well, one thing that happened this year for us in computer science is our dean was willing, he, he raised this salary of our positions, our new higher positions by like $15,000. Uh, and with that, we were able to hire a new female faculty member. 
Uh, we had been being turned, we, we were in the 10th percentile according to the Talby survey, which uh, analyzes uh, a computer science faculty surveys. And we talked our dean into, uh, um, into increasing it. We we're very grateful to have him <laughs> because of that. So that's, that's one big thing that's happened. Um, um, I, I think- That's I think a really big thing. And I had no idea that you were going to answer in that way, and um, but but I'm I'm noticing myself that those things are important, just like Dr. Taylor was talking about. You can have that promotion, which is great, and that's that's an aspirational goal. But then also to have the salaries to fit and match it, so that you can, you know, stay at wonderful colleges like UAH and Miles College and and A and M, and you know, stay in the state. So thank you for the answer. We have a question in the chat. I'm moving to that now, just one moment. And the question is to all, and this is from Dr. Diaro um, with the National Science Foundation. She said, I noticed that much of the data shared is disaggregated by men and women, but not by the intersection of gender and race or ethnicity. How can we make sure that women of color are not lost in the data because there are so few of them. And she'd like that question to be answered by any of the any and all of the PIs that would like to comment on that. How can we make sure that women of color are not lost in our disaggregated data? Thank you. That's an excellent question. Yeah, I'll I'll go first in trying to answer that. The data is aggregated and disaggregated up at just um, male and female and then across the ranks. I, I think that for the first few years of the advance grant, having the resources to pull the data has kind of led to that necessity. But each of the advanced teams has um, had uh, Excel tables in different ways that they can uh, collect data, uh, looking at specifically with respect to, to gender or male, female, and then also with respect to underrepresented minorities. And I, I hope that each of the teams are now expending some resources to at least look internally for their own uses. That data, I, I think, I think the data can be very sensitive. And so I, um, I, I think there's a less of a, I'm not, I don't know what I'm saying at this point. And I'm going to shut right. up. <laughs> You're right. Uh, the data is sharing that kind of data. Uh, initially, you know, we ran into a little stumbling block. To, how's that going to be used to so forth? But we had already been in a fight about um, salaries and in, in, uh, previously because we knew that the salaries were lower for women and in different disciplines. So the unit and we were also suffering from what we call salary uh, compression. And so we had to dig deep. <laughs> And so there was some concern about it. So we, we started, uh, again, this, this grant help us, helped us to focus, to look at uh, gender, race, and other things, intersectionality and so forth, in terms of, of uh, where, where we got, were in terms of the different science disciplines, especially. And so we're doing that. Um, I think it's necessary. And so we've done that. We made a giant step forward, but still uh, we have a lot more to go in terms of those salary issues. And, and then also um, just knowing where, where people are. Great. And I, I would like to add to that uh, because as we have worked through um, the intersectionality of our data, one of, the, one of the issues that I had to put on the table was the notion that data is not neutral mm -hmm. and the technology used to collect the data shapes the data and is shaped by it. And the creators of the technology shape the technology. And so when we use technology to collect data, we also bring a worldview into the process. And so therefore it becomes a question of who is interpreting the data and what does that data speak to in that um, in that work i mean you know people say well the data speaks for itself no it does not always speak for itself and we always have to make sure that we're looking at it with a lens that helps us see the question that speaks to this question of intersectionality mm -hmm. alongside that what the numbers are also telling us 
I think that was critical information, Dr. Dilworth, and I actually was going to come your way for a response from you on this because I thought that was right up your alley. And I think this is helpful for us to understand and for others to be able to understand as well that, you know, it depending on who programmed the um, the data or the collection of the data, data would have an impact on, um, on the outcome as well. So Dr. Lahim, I see that your hand is raised. Uh, yes, at Oakwood, um, we have a challenge in the physical sciences. So uh, we find that there are slightly more um, women uh, biology faculty oh. than, than, than men. And now overall, the salary, it's, it's very difficult as a private institution to compete with salaries. And we find it especially so in like uh, chemistry, you know, the physical sciences. But um, it seems that, uh, that there are more females in, in the life sciences or biological sciences than um, uh, uh, that, that are available. Okay, uh, in math, we, we have about an equal balance also between um, male and female. But uh, I think it's, it's uh, the area that, you, that you're looking at where you will find whether there is a balance or an imbalance. But salary does play a big part in it because it's very difficult for us to compete with, um, with, with larger institutions. To me too, uh, it's a, I'm not sure that it's a question that we can answer here in this moment, but to consider for the future um, in a collective way, because ultimately um, I think there, there are people who are really committed and it's not always driven by dollars, but how do we identify um, a strategy that would be useful you know, sort of going in, recognizing that resources are always at the core of trying to get people, good people, and keep them. And I think Dr. Jones has asked that question several times, you know, and I keep thinking about it myself, you know, in terms of recruitment and retention, you know, um, what be, beyond salary, what might be other incentives that could be mm -hmm. offered as a part of a way to attract people? Right. And we do know from um, theories of motivation and, and, and workforce development that um, salaries are hygiene factors and there are other things that are motivated, motivating factors. A hygiene factor is something that you have to have, you know, it's, it's to, to make you stay at a job and a motivating factor is something that contributes to your satisfaction at that job, your willingness to stay no matter what your salary is, right? So if you have a hygiene factor, it means that if you um, you're not happy at your job, no amount of money will let you stay. But if motivating factor is if you're if you're happy at your job, it almost you know balances out the amount of money that you make, that you still will be okay with staying at that organization or inspired to stay there. Um, and the money is not the biggest factor. So um, Dr. Garrow put in the chat that maybe we should consider more qualitative work as we look at the experiences of women of color in our advancement. And I think that that would be um, good. She also made the suggestion on creating more welcoming and inclusive workplaces to be able to recruit and re retain people uh, that we know we want and need on our, on our campuses. So I, I love the, that feedback and we'll be looking forward to her, um, her, key, her speech when, um, when she talks more to us about um, about our advanced project and her work. But one of the, one so, of the things one of the things I observed that I found very interesting is that uh, a lot of the junior faculty and some others uh, women need the role models and senior level positions. Uh, I was surprised that there are some that really need the encouragement that you need to go after this position. Mm -hmm. When there are positions, uh, administrative positions or other leadership positions, uh, other women who can uh, work with them and say, yes, you can do that. You can do that job. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have sort of discouraged uh, because you haven't seen women in those positions in the past at mm -hmm. your institution, right? Right. So mm -hmm. I think that encouragement is very important. Is right. that, yes, you can do it and you and we support you. Okay. Right. And it also speaks to, I guess, the point that Dr. Diarra is making about welcoming and inclusive environments. Mm -hmm. And I would go down to the micro level of departments, especially 
uh, where women uh, faculty re we spend most of their time in making sure that those departments, first of all, look inward to do the work mm -hmm. to ensure that, I mean, you know, there are some departments that historically have been dominated by males and specifically white males. And so when you start to look outward in terms of the diversifying the faculty, what is the groundwork that needs to be done to mm -hmm. ensure that you are creating a welcoming environment? I can give an example, my experience at a past institution where the first woman was invited um, to join the faculty. Um, and essentially it continued as a process of business as usual. She didn't stay very long because as she felt that it was not a place for her. And the people who worked in that unit basically were surprised. I mean, you know, it's like, well, you haven't, you didn't do the work. I mean, you know, there are concerns and issues that we have as our morning speaker pointed out, um, you can't lump the fact that she's a female into the fact that, um, well, this should work for her and it didn't. And so they were really surprised when she decided that she would leave. Um, but I think that that's one of the important things that has to happen is that the work needs to start at ground zero right. in the units where um, women will spend most of their time. Mm -hmm. Those are really good points and really speak to all of the ways that we can start to or continue to evaluate our workspaces and our environments to look at how inclusive they are and how welcoming they are to people and giving them the opportunity. I think there was one of the earlier, um, the, the keynotes, the, the earliest speaker, um, when he talked about intersectionality and actually asking questions and finding out from people what their experiences are, that could be a way for us to make, make sure that we're making inclusive environments. And you got a thumbs up in the chat, uh, Dr. Dilworth <laughs> from Dr. Diaro. She said, you are so right. So mm -hmm. this is great. So I'm a big TikToker. I, I do some TikToking, went viral last summer, some just things with my family, but I, I read a lot, we all do. But um, there's a TikToker, her name is at Professor Casey, and she's an information scientist. And she talks about tech, ethics, law, the internet, academia, um, but she's always talking about what you uh, referred to earlier, Dr. Dilworth, how they're, uh, you know, ethics and tech and ethics and data collection. And, you know, TikTok is just 30 seconds to 60 seconds. So it's, you know, it's for us, but it's also for everyone to be able to just digest the information and see how much we need to take a deeper look mm -hmm. into something. Even if it's presented in a chart doesn't mean it's automatically true. Mm -hmm. Um, or factual or speaks to everyone's experience. So those are um, some things that I think of, could be helpful. And then also there's a lot of people that are reading this book. Um, I think it's called Invisible People. Uh, and it's a book about data and how it has a different, a different impact on women, everything from how things are purchased to how things are sold. And so, it, yeah, that's right, Invisible Women. And it's called uh, Data Bias in a World designed for men. So mm -hmm. it, it talks about just what we're speaking to as well. Um, but then if you take that intersectionality and go another level deeper and look at the experiences of women of color, then it shows how much the work that we're doing now is very, very valuable and how our work will continue to be valuable and needed for many, many years to come. So thank you to everyone that was on the panel. I really enjoyed getting to hear more about the work that's being done at University of Alabama at Birmingham, Miles College, Alabama A&M, Oakwood University, University of Alabama at Huntsville, um, and then also for our program evaluator. So on behalf of President Bobby Knight, it's been my honor to uh, be our moderator for this panel and to work with my fellow PIs and co-PIs. So thank you for this opportunity. Where she studied the message scale optical properties of thin organic polymer films. She was selected as a presidential management fellow and recruited by the US Department of Education to manage a relatively new Hispanic serving institutions capacity building program. In this position, she worked with HSIs to strengthen educational programs as well as the administrative and physical capacity of those institutions. 
In 2013, she was asked to serve as Acting Deputy Division Director in the Division of Human Resource Development, where she served for six months and then served eight months as Acting Deputy Division Director of the Division of Research on Learning in Formal and Informal Settings. After these management details, she returned to manage the advanced program and ser serves as the HRD li li liaison to the EHR core research program, focusing on broadening participation in STEM research. I'm so excited to be able to present to you, Dr. Jesse Diallo, welcome. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation to participate today. I'm grateful that I was able to uh, attend the first keynotes presentation um, because it uh, not only sets me up for my presentation, it was very well uh, it, uh, done and informative, but also for the panel session where I learned about all the great things that you're doing in Alabama to support systemic change for faculty. Um, that was a real treat for sure. Okay. Um, so I do have a short presentation and happy to take questions and answers, uh, do questions and answers at the end. Um, but go ahead and interrupt me if there is something that is um, urgent to clarify um, during the presentation, that's, that's fine as well. Um, so I wanted to talk today, um, building on what um, we learned this morning about what intersectionality is and where it came from. And I wanted to tie it into an important uh, perspective to include in the systemic change work that the advanced program at NSF supports. Um, so that's what I'm going to try to do in the next few slides. Okay, so the advanced program's goal overall, our vision for a um, future, is that we would have a productive, successful, and diverse STEM academic workforce. Um, and currently, the STEM academic workforce has individuals um, that are underrepresented um, in the uh, rank as uh, STEM faculty. So the, the, and the reasons for that um, have been articulated um, over many decades in the social and behavioral science research. Um, and that's uh, reflected in the challenge that we face in order to meet this vision um, that we have. Um, the challenge is that there are systemic inequities and cultural and climate factors in higher education institutions, as well as other STEM focused organizations like funding agencies, for example, that impact the interest, recruitment, retention, and success of individuals that are members of gender, racial, and ethnic groups that are underrepresented in STEM academic careers. Um, and so how do we um, address this challenge? And so the advanced program has been designed um, to address this challenge by focusing on changing those systems uh, within which we do scientific research and education at institutions of higher education. Um, and I just wanted to briefly remind you uh, about what we mean when we talk about equity in STEM um, in relation to the advanced program. So equity for us is uh, something that could potentially be an issue at your institution, even if you have full representation of individuals uh, from the population participating in your faculty. So even in that biology department that has 50% women um, faculty, there might still be equity issues. Um, and an example of an equity that issue is um, faculty salary discrepancies. And this data is a little old, um, but I have no doubt that if we were to update it, it would be very similar. There is um, a differential in pay um, by uh, for, for faculty in the different ranks by gender. Um, and not all of it can be explained by differences in product productivity, et cetera. Um, and so pay gaps is an example where you might still have an equity issue, even if you had 50% women in every department. So in that biology department, for example, are those individual faculty representative across all three ranks of um, faculty? Are 30% um, are of them full professors? Um, are they serving on key institutional committees? Those are equity issues that um, you might still have, even if you have full representation. So then I'm gonna move to talking about um, intersectionality, um, building on what you heard this morning from um, my colleague at UCLA, who um, it said it very, very well about the history of intersectionality and where it came from. Um, so 
the way that we've been using it and operationalizing it in advance is a little bit different than the um, original intention um, by those who framed this theory. Um, and so I also wanted to bring it into um, uh, the STEM specific settings as well. So the examples from this morning were um, from legal um, issues, but as we learned, the application of that, that um, framing and theory is salient to other situations. And so I wanted to talk specifically about STEM and give you some examples where the different social identities of an individual, which is what gender and race are, um, uh, might uh, impact them differently in different types of STEM education workplaces and um, settings. And so on this wheel, I have different settings. So we have a, um, a uh, conference, a classroom, a faculty meeting. Each one of these places might have a different set of experiences um, for the individual who has uh, certain identities and doesn't have other identities. Um, so at a conference, for example, an individual who is a um, early career faculty um, uh, who is, is not disabled, um, but is young um, and is a, a female faculty, for example, um, her age might be very uh, relevant to her in a conference setting where the median age is, is higher. Um, and so that might impact her um, reception by others. It might impact her perceived welcome and inclusion in that meeting. And it might impact her actual welcome and include and, include and respect in that meeting. Um, and that same individual might go into a classroom, a STEM classroom where they have are good at teaching undergraduate STEM students and different uh, uh, identities might now be uh, an asset. Um, so for example, her age might be more of an asset when she's in a classroom setting where the students are closer to her young age. Um, but now maybe her gender is an issue more um, in that classroom because it is highly populated by male students, for example. Um, and, and the interactions there uh, might be more or less uh, impacted um, uh, because of the setting. So I just wanted to give you these examples. This is not um, <laughs> a, 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 a based on a study. This is just examples of how uh, an individual's social identities might impact um, how they walk through life um, and how they experience and walk through STEM settings um, uh, and how that can impact them personally and professionally in um, their ability to uh, bring their whole self to that setting. Right. So I also wanted to remind you that the intention is not to break down everyone down into an exhaustive list of social identities, right? Um, intersectional, the thinking intersectionally is not just disaggregating numbers. Um, and in fact, it it's probably uh, requires more qualitative um, attention than just disaggregating numbers. Um, and so in the work that we're doing and you're doing um, in Alabama, it's important for us to identify the um, especially meaningful and impactful um, identities um, and how those um, uh, uh, translate into experiences, which can be barriers or facilitators to some an individual's success in their scientific uh, work. Okay, so um, I also, so, so just to um, bring it home again, why ADVANCE, um, which is focused on systemic change in universities and colleges, is interested in intersectionality. And I just have a few um, uh, um, highlights to, to say, to explain why. Um, and one of them is that systemic change requires the analysis and understanding of the systems of power dynamics in organizations in um, institutions of higher education, for example. Um, and, and this is directly related to intersectional theory and the um, uh, focus on uh, power and privilege um, in systems that some have and some don't. Um, so therefore, if we want to make changes in systems, we need to pay attention to those dynamics of power in those systems um, and they should be on the table for potential change. Um, so an intersectional perspective is then necessary component um, in order to do the systems change that we want to do with the advanced program. 
um, and ultimately result in institutions of higher education that are inclusive and welcoming to all. Um, the other, and another reason why intersectionality is important to advance is that while the program started as a focus on women in STEM, its focus um, on, on gender since 2001, um, it's not this only social identity um, we know um, that impacts a person's experiences in STEM educational programs and workplaces. Um, it, therefore, if the goal of the program is gender, identity, gender equity for STEM faculty, then we cannot achieve that if any one is left behind or left out in the efforts of the advanced program. And that's why an intersectional lens can help us to ensure that we are not unintentionally leaving out anyone in the process of systemic change. Um, additionally, we know that policies, practices, and procedures are not indifferent to people's identities. So therefore, an intersectional lens is important in the advanced systemic change work. For example, um, early dual career policies in institutions of higher education seemed like a very inclusive um, effort, but many of them use language that uh, denigrated the second hire or the trailing spouse um, and set that person up for failure. And oftentimes they assume that the, the couple was opposite sex and married couples as well. And so it was not inclusive in that sense. Um, but the, uh, the, and the way they were implemented, it was often um, setting up the, the spouse <laughs> or the partner for failure because of the title that they were given as secondary or um, trailing. Um, and so, for example, so that is a, a good example of how um, assumptions um, and lack of thinking intersectionally ha may have made some of those early dual career policies less um, um, effective um, than they could have been. Um, and another example might be requirements that a university might have instituted to, to ensure that all of their uh, faculty committees have diversity, um, particularly their search and, and promotion committees, um, which is, seems like a great solution to an issue of representation. But if at the same time, <laughs> we know that we have very small numbers of diverse faculty um, and we don't give those individuals release time or other kinds of resources for that service work, um, and recognize that uh, service work equally to work on research um, and research productivity uh, for tenure and promotion, then we're just setting up our colleagues for failure if this is uh, an institutional requirement and policy. Um, it might help with one ish area of issues, but it, it creates another. And we, we know that uh, women and, and faculty of color in particular often have large service workloads that um, they want to do, which is great because if we as organizations of higher education didn't need to do that service work, we wouldn't have those committees, right? Right. <laughs> so, so can I interrupt you there? Because that sure. is really the problem. <laughs> uh, uh, over, I know we want to give the young faculty who are trying to advance uh, that experience, but you're right. They're overworked, overloaded, and they don't count service the way they count research and publication. So how do you address that in the policy? Right, um, we can talk about that some more. I have one more, I think, example, um, and then we can talk about maybe addressing some of these issues. Okay, all right. Okay, okay. Um, and so one more example, I wanted to talk about this idea of unearned inclusion. Um, that uh, is coming from Kimberly Crenshaw, who, who was um, the first person to uh, frame the theory of intersectionality in terms of the, the legal issues that we learned about this morning. Um, but more recently, she was talking about this concept of unearned inclusion. Um, and we need to be able to attend to not just unfair exclusion, but also un unearned inclusion, which is part of our challenge for equity in uh, systemic uh, change and institutions of higher education. Um, and so in, in light of this concept, um, I don't want to diminish the original intent of the intersectional theories uh, that were grounded in a focus on women of color and the significant oppressions that they have experienced and are experiencing 
um, in society in various ways and including STEM settings. Um, but I do think that the idea that everyone has social identities um, that impacts the way they navigate the world, how they impact the world as well, is worth a little extension of the theory um, to, uh, to think about the intersectionality of those who are overrepresented as STEM faculty. So in a way um, that what I'm trying to, to suggest is that we may want to think about the populations that are overrepresented <laughs> um, and why they're overrepresented. Um, and also to understand better how to help them um, understand the issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and STEM, given where they're coming from, um, what their cultural uh, experiences have been, what their lived experiences have been. Um, and this might be an important uh, strategy to generate uh, change and, and their um, willingness um, let go of some of the power that they have earned. So for example, international faculty from countries that don't have anti-discrimination laws like the US does, um, those faculty are coming with a different baseline of understanding what the issues are. Um, they may have very strong gendered roles in their society that they're coming from, that they were born and raised in and maybe educated in. Um, and so those faculty would need to be um, uh, starting in a different place uh, in order to understand concepts like implicit bias. Um, even the language that we use um, in English might be a barrier to some faculty uh, to um, understanding what we're talking about. So this, this uh, is just an example of where in the work that you do, you might wanna think about who your audience is who actually needs to change because it's not the women that we wanna change when we talk about systemic change. Uh, we wanna change the system and the overrepresented STEM faculty. Um, we have to think about the identities of a senior faculty person who is likely a male, a white male, who may have earned a lot of power, and I have that in quotes, by being employed for a long time because they're senior. And that's how things, how, that's how power and influence was delegated and, and sometimes still is. Um, and so you only have full faculty on your search committees or your tenure and promotion committees or your award committees. Um, and then you have very little diversity on those committees um, and very little um, new ways of thinking um, and new experiences um, on those committees. And so you perpetuate some um, traditions that should not be perpetuated anymore. Um, and so that's uh, an, an example of this I wanted to share with you from Florida International University, which is an HSI, um, where they did a study because they have a few departments, um, I believe in engineering, that are almost 100% um, international faculty. Um, and this creates a very uh, difficult situation for them when they want to approach that department and talk about the need to recruit women and the need to recruit women of color in particular. Um, and this particular um, department, um, the, they have done some survey work and some training with them and have um, uh, found out that um, they're they freely um, uh, have a preference for the, the race and gender uh, and uh, cultural background of the students that they recruit. Um, so the students that they recruit and the postdocs all come from one country. Um, and they said, that's, that's not a problem, that's fine. Um, but then they claim that they don't have that same bias when they hire faculty, um, yet their diversity of their faculty would suggest otherwise. Um, so it's a very interesting area to um, learn more about and unpack what's going on there um, and can be a very uh, powerful tool, I think, to have in your advanced toolkit um, when you're thinking about uh, making changes in your institution. Okay, and I wanted to wrap up and then we can do the questions um, by sharing this um, analogy that I, um, I really enjoy. And I learned it from um, listening to a YouTube video from Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, and she had talked about intersectionality as a tool, um, like a prism um, to, uh, to, that you could use to hold up to a problem to, to ensure that you can see all the nuances of the situation. Because um, without knowing 
the nuances of the situation and seeing all this color here, you would think you have a problem because it's a, a, a white beam of light, but instead you, with, with, with the knowing that it's actually a multicolored rainbow of different wavelengths, that gives you the ability to better uh, problem solve. And so I, um, I leave you with this uh, analogy so that as you go through your day and you're um, wanting to apply what you've learned about intersectionality, you can think about the prism and holding the prism up to whatever situation you're, post, you're facing um, to, to uh, you know, take a minute to fully understand the nuances that you're dealing with in that problem. Okay. And I hope that was helpful and I'm happy to take questions. I think um, there was a question about um, strategies. So we could start there if that works. Mm -hmm. Actually, I, I think that that does work um, to just uh, dive right in and start talking about strategies. Great. Um, okay, so I think the one of the questions was about service work. Um, one of the examples that I gave and then that was what motivated the question, um, because I, I have a sense that you feel that very acutely <laughs> on this team and with your faculty. I know that, uh, for example, HBCUs do have significant service workload um, on their faculty and very little um, ability to release people from teaching work loads as well. Um, and so that may, it, it likely compounds the issues um, that women faculty are experiencing at HBCUs. Um, and so there are solutions to monitoring service work and changing the uh, recognition system and reward systems that you have in place so that you can reward that work uh, when someone has uh, either chosen to do some work or have been asked to do some work in that area, right? Um, so, uh, so there is, is quite a lot of resources on thinking about this issue um, in, from, the, from the University of Maryland College Park. Um, uh, Carrie Ann O'Meara uh, has published a few tools and there should be, I believe there's a, a pretty decent website that talks about how they tried to adapt some strategies to other institutions in Maryland, which I, th I think include University of Maryland Eastern Shore, which is an HBCU. Um, so you could see some uh, products from that effort um, and maybe adapt them to what you're doing. But essentially the, the key takeaways with service work is that um, the institution really should take a, a hard look at what they are doing and what they're asking their faculty to do in terms of service um, and making sure it's valuable to the institution, right? So if the institution doesn't need that work, um, then stop doing it. <laughs> and stop having faculty sit on that committee. Um, if the institution actually needs that work, then give those faculty credit that's re uh, reflective of the amount of time and effort that they put into those committees. So some committees are higher workload than others, um, and that should be part of your system for monitoring service work. Um, some people get tapped to do the high, heavy lift work often, and those people should, um, you know, one, your institution and your department chairs should know that that's happening and either intervene or compensate that individual with release time or summer support or, or a differential or the ability to uh, get credit for that service work when it comes time for tenure and promotion. Um, right. So, um, you know, any, any more, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, those resources that I'm pointing you to are probably much more <laughs> descriptive than what I'm sharing, but I'm just giving you an idea of how uh, this issue could be resolved systemically. Um, so even if, it, even if it's just like an Excel sheet that all of your chairs keep so that they know that um, Jeanette has been doing the same committee for five years and never gotten a break from it, <laughs> um, that you know, it's time for somebody else to do the heavy lifting and or and reward Janetta for doing that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just simply doing that is a big difference. So right okay. now, many institutions don't. Okay, that that was very helpful, and I'll look her up. Um, University of Maryland College Park. Huh? Yes, Carrie Ann <laughs> O'Meara, and I can send you a link to us. Okay, all right, thank you. 
Okay, so Dr. Dr. Dilworth put a put a comment in the chat. Yes. Yeah, so when we talk about overrepresented faculty, um, that could be different from institution and type. It says besides <laughs> stating the obvious when it comes to diversity. Yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Do you want to read the question? Geraldine is frozen, I think. You're freezing, Geraldine. I'll read the question. Besides stating the obvious, when it I comes did, to, I did freeze. Yeah, you know, it comes to diversity in STEM departments <clears throat> where there is an overrepresentation of Asian, Indian groups, and so forth. <clears throat> how do we enter the conversation with those who do not see or understand just how problematic it is to be blind to who is not at the table? Yes, um, I, <laughs> I don't have the solution to that. Um, if I did, I guess I would be uh, very, um, very uh, rich, maybe, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, but I do know that some of our grantees have developed different strategies and tried them out. So I would look at the Florida International University um, resources, um, because um, in their case, they have, um, uh, it was, it was a Asian or East Asian um, a, a majority department that they're still working with. Um, and so they might have come up with some solutions, but my uh, understanding is that um, what you do in that case is uh, find out what, <laughs> where they are, what's their baseline. Um, so they um, wouldn't know necessarily uh, about the American culture um, and uh, experiences of racial and ethnic minorities that were born and raised here um, and went to college in, in, in the United States, they wouldn't understand necessarily. Like for example, you probably have some colleagues that have um, come from African countries. Uh, and while they present as, as black faculty, they were not raised in the United States. And so their understanding of what it means to be to go to high school as an African American man <laughs> is not the same as as if they had been here and lived through it themselves, right? So, in the same way, you have to work with that population of faculty from um, Africa to um, uh, share <laughs> what's happened in the United States and why students um, uh, may from these groups of of uh, uh, categories. Uh, may have different ways of approaching their STEM education, and, and et cetera. Um, it, you would do the same thing for those from the Asian countries and uh, Indian countries. Um, uh, and basically understanding where they're coming from and um, giving them the building blocks to make the right decision, because many of them will um, if they understand what's happening. So, uh, for example, the, the, as I mentioned, the, the, what, is, what do we mean by implicit biases? Um, you know, uh, it's not necessarily include, uh, understood the same by all. Um, same thing with intersectionality. So if you said that, you know, to a room full of engineers, it would mean something else. If you said it to a room full of mathematicians, it might mean a Venn diagram. If you say it to a social scientist, it means the, the social identities and their intersecting um, uh, impacts on, on that individual. So you have to define things and, and explain what you mean. And ask and let, allow them to ask questions. Allow them to um, investigate the ideas that you're trying to share. Um, so, um, and it, it, sometimes it might take bringing in external help. I would imagine so that it's not you having the conversation with them as their colleague, but maybe uh, an uh, external expert who is having that conversation with them so that at, that at the beginning or something like that. So using facilitators creatively might be a strategy. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I wish there was better solutions other than <laughs> slowing down and <laughs> taking a few steps back, um, uh, but that might be what's necessary. Um, but at the same time, you know, that's only one piece. That's the culture and climate piece. Um, you can still be working on systemic changes while you're working on that culture and climate piece. And those systemic changes should um, scaffold um, the culture and climate changes that you want, right? So for example, systemic changes that reward um, DEI work 
uh, that faculty have done um, can send a message to other faculty that, oh, this is important and it's valuable and it's equally as valuable as the work that I'm doing in my lab. Um, I'm going to pay attention to that. I want to get that travel grant as well. I want to get, you know, the extra graduate student support. Um, so if the institution is sending those messages in what they reward and recognize as excellence in STEM, um, others will start to pay attention. Um, but at the same time, you need to do the culture and climate change work as well. Thank you for that. And I just have a follow-up question that uh, really speaks to, I guess, a broader issue associated with um, the advanced program among others with NSF and other federal funding agencies where, you know, the national conversation has evolved to, in many states, particularly in the South um, and some of the other border states um, around issues of race. Um, and the, the idea that um, on some level, there's a movement to cancel race as a factor associated with the work that we do in higher education. Has there been any conversation at NSF about um, these um, external conversations and how the uh, Institute plans to respond? Um, so th there, there have been discussions at the program officer level and um, in with other funding organizations. So I know that the nonprofit world is paying attention to this issue. Um, in fact, I believe the Lumina Foundation published mm -hmm. uh, a report recently talking about uh, the kind of policy pushback on these topics. And, and I think that it has some solutions, some suggested um, solutions in there for dealing with the situation. But um, NSF has not yet um, come out with any kinds of guidance uh, for grantees. Um, if, uh, if the federal government were to, it, it were to make a statement, it would basically reflect our current policies and guidelines that are, are in place now. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, um, if uh, states want federal dollars, they need to uh, follow the rules of the, of the federal dollars. Um, and so that often can um, um, supersede state level rules, but it's up to the state on that. So, um, uh, if they want the dollars, they need to uh, uh, adhere to certain kinds of actions and behaviors that have been established by the federal government. Um, and that is one way that you can um, still um, put some boundaries on what is happening currently. In our, um, uh, but uh, I don't think that NSF individually will come out with a statement on this um, if, if, um, if it uh, in the near future. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Sherilyn, are you still there? Looks like she had to step away. Happy to have the panelists put their, their um, videos back on, so I'm not the only one. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, here I am. Great. Um, looks like Geraldine had to step away. I'm not sure what's going on there, um, but she was facilitating the session. Are there any other questions for um, Dr. Diero? Comments? Uh, yes, I have a question in the chat. A question in the chat. Um, yes. Just following up on the question of race, do you think the multiple variables or parameters used to define intersectionality may be canceling out the race factor? Um, are you talking about um, other uh, factors that um, are related to the race and ethnicity of individuals that you could use instead of talking about the race and ethnicity? Yes, let me, let me explain myself. Uh, so uh, looking at the will that you showed that had all this, uh, the different definitions or identities that can um, identify with intersectionality. So uh, you will come into a situation of overlapping so that maybe you may not be black or black, but then you are female or uh, then you are not female, but then 
you have a different language. And then so many of, as, as more factors get into the part, then the population that are, belong to each of these categories become like fluidy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, and, and that's just, I'm just asking it from an Yeah, yeah, which is why I, I, I wanted, I said at the beginning that intersectional thinking and the way that we're approaching it uh, with advance by expanding it beyond gender and race, um, is not to uh, it, it's not to disaggregate your data. So intersectional thinking is not just disaggregation of data. There's more to it than that. Um, and so you shouldn't um, be trying to identify all of these things and what's important to an individual and then work with that individual necessarily. But you should allow that individual to be themselves, whatever it is, um, in every setting in their workplace or educational program. Um, and so that means the system would need to be open <laughs> to a, a range of individual identities um, and welcoming and um, not allowing others in that system to um, uh, be act negatively towards other, the, the individuals that are not, let's say, in the majority. Um, so, you know, the uh, things like, you know, if um, a chair in a, in a chair in a department meeting um, says something uh, in response to an off color remark about women in STEM that's made in the meeting and the chair says, we don't talk, we don't do that here. Mm -hmm. um, that's setting a culture and climate where, you know, it's not okay to talk negatively about women in STEM. Mm -hmm. um, in this workplace, you know, uh, that, that is a example of, um, uh, intervening in a negative culture. Um, but you need to empower that chair to do that in the first place. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and say, it's okay. And we want you to do that and, um, uh, you know, reward them when they do. Mm -hmm. Um, and I believe I, I can't, and can't even think back far enough to know why I was mentioning that as an example <laughs> of something related to your question, uh, but hopefully it tied together for you. <laughs> no, no, so, so uh, yes, you did. But so um, thinking beyond the attitude issues to say you are writing a grant and you are trying to secure some funding, then I was looking at how to define your target population uh, in terms yeah. of sexuality. That, that's where my yeah. question is going. Yeah, so uh, the, the other thing that when somebody is proposing a grant to advance, we're not expecting you to address all the possible <laughs> social identities in your strategies, because some of them may be uh, un irrelevant to your setting, <laughs> right? And some of them um, may not be as important as others. So we want you to decide um, what's the most important thing for your institution in terms of addressing um, the culture and climate and the system so that it's welcoming and inclusive. So um, at an HBCU that might be different, uh, you know, a teaching HBCU might be different than a research HBCU, yeah, so. Okay. Other you. questions? Comments? We don't have any additional questions posted in the chat, um, but I think, there you are. Carolyn, you changed locations. I did change locations. <laughs> How about <laughs> that? A, a, better, a better signal or something right. like that. Got gotcha. you. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, it's you're on. We don't have additional questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I was about to say that it, in case, in that case, we can uh, give them the gift of thirty minutes back. That's right. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that everybody would appreciate that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think Go ahead. everything went well. Yeah. 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 Think of think of how we could change the world collectively if we each had 30 minutes. Absolutely. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. And I just want to end this by thanking everyone. The the Alabama Part a Partnership for the Advancement of Gender Equity in STEM, as a reminder, is designed to foster gender equity through a focus on the identification and the elimination of organizational barriers that impede the full participation and advancement of diverse faculty in higher education institutions, particularly in Alabama. So I wanna thank, I wanna begin by thanking our um, speakers today, beginning with Dr. Cordova, who basically 
shed um, important light on the definition of inter intersectionality and how we might think of that in terms of um, the work that we're doing. And also to Dr. Diero, who helped us to better understand how the intersectionality um, is woven throughout the advanced program and the need for us to be intentional about the ways in which we consider um, the multiple spaces and ways in which identity plays a significant role in the lives of the people we want to support. Um, I also want to thank the, all of my co-PIs at our partner institutions. Uh, I congratulate all of you on doing great work and I hope that you will continue to be engaged with us as we forge ahead. Um, the new concept that we learned from uh, Dr. Darrow, unearned inclusion, I think is something that I want to ponder in terms of the ways in which that is likely playing out in, in this work because I've had some very interesting questions of recent. Um, but I wanna leave you with a thought about impact because ultimately I think that this is what we're hoping um, that our work will do and that is to have some impact on our institutions and to just remember that every action we take impacts the lives of others around us. The question is, are you aware of the impact? It is not merely a job, but a quest to make an impact. No one gets remembered for the things they don't do. So let's continue to be, to be encouraged by the good work that we're doing. And again, thank you to all of you. Thank you to our participants who um, stayed in here with us. I see that a few people started out from the beginning and are still with us. And I wanna thank you for that. And thank you all again for your participation today. Thank you, Dr. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. All right, bye. Be safe. Bye.